Hi everybody, good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. It is Wednesday, January 11th, 2017. This is not a new webinar. In fact, it's probably the topic that I have presented on the most. Uh, I was talking with Stephanie about actually about which one we would have tonight, and she talked about this idea that there's a lot of questions that have come in during recent broadcasts about boundaries. And so tonight I, I want to, I'm going to review a lot of things, share a lot of things that have been shared, but I, I want to be very clear about one thing. As I go throughout the webinar, please submit questions to Stephanie that you have about boundaries. It's one of the most difficult topics, I think, to understand. It's very, very subtle. And I was thinking about it just before I started the broadcast this evening, and I thought, I think one of the reasons why it's challenging is because there's no right answer to the questions. A boundary is defined by you. And that's why when people ask me about appropriate boundaries or the extension of those, which are appropriate limits, it's difficult for me to answer that question and in some ways philosophically impossible for me to answer that question because a boundary is defined by what I need to feel okay. And then once I answer that question, then I can set a limit in my life and in relationships, especially in regards to our children, we're going to associate the word limits with that more often. Um, but, but a boundary is a sense of my well-being, a sense of what I need to feel fed, to feel okay, to feel safe to feel at peace. Um, and then the extension of that is, and I think that it's one of the things that I find has been illuminating for me the last year or two, is this idea that self-care, that's what really boundaries are for. They're, they're about self-care. And when we think about boundaries as changing other people, I'm going to set a boundary in this relationship to change the other person. That's not the ideal. That's not what we're striving for. We set a boundary to feel okay. The other person then gets to decide if they can participate in the relationship, given that boundary, right? So, so that's the relationship. So we have a lot of slides to get to tonight, but I also want you to submit your questions as we go. And Stephanie, if you want to pause and even if you think one needs to be inserted while I'm talking, I, I want to open that up and I'll pause and look down on it. And then I'll, I'll read it to the audience and, and share my answer, my thoughts on it. So first of all, I want to talk about resentment. Something I discovered for myself was that resentment is almost always a signal of poor self-care. Resentment, for me, is a red flag that I'm expecting something from somebody that I'm not getting, and I'm not getting clear about my boundary. And, and so it's really a sign to me that I need to go and find myself. It helps me to preserve my own integrity because I can look at myself and say, wait a sec, what am I not doing to take care of myself in the relationship? What am I hoping the other person will do for me that they're not coming through with? What, are, what am I hoping that they will mind read or, or want to do for me that they're not doing? What agreement are they violating that I need to then get clear about myself and how I'm going to respond to that now and also how I'm going to respond to that in the future? Our, our anger, our resentment can motivate us to say no, ideally. If I'm in a, in a relationship where I feel like you're taking advantage of me or you're not fulfilling the partnership that we've expressed as, as a part of this agreement, then I get to say no next time I'm asked for something. I get to say no about participating in the relationship going forward. It helps us. It, it signals for us to, to, that there's a need for a boundary, that there's a need for improved self-care, and it gives us permission to take care of our needs. It can defend us from predators, not just wallowing in the resentment. See, if we just wallow in the, in the anger and the resentment, and I think of resentment as kind of stale anger. If we just wallow in that, it does us no good. But what it can do, if we are, allow ourselves to turn it into action, is it can, it can encourage us to take care of our needs, especially in the face of people who are going to take advantage of us and, and hurt us. It's a signal that our rights are being violated, but again, not from a victim place, but from a place that I need to now take steps to ensure that I get taken care of. Um, we're being compromised. We're giving too much. And it's important to, to say this. It's not a behavior. I know that's simple and obvious, but I think we, we mistake resentment or even the expression of resentment or anger as a behavior or a boundary, and it's not that. That's, a, that's an expression of a feeling. It's not something that we do to ensure that our boundary gets set. It's the context in which we express the boundary, which we express what we expect 
expect in a relationship, what we really demand in a relationship, but it's not in itself the setting of a boundary. This is a, the quote from um, Harriet Lerner. I think my favorite book, I, I'm sure many of you have read this book because I've recommended it so many times, but The Dance of Anger. And she says, anger is a tool for change when it challenges us to become more of an expert on the self and less of an expert on others. And I think for those of us who struggle with boundaries, with codependency, I think we can get fixated in our anger and resentment at others, hoping that they will change, waiting for them to take care of us. And we stay stuck when we do that. And going further than that, she says, no matter how long I'm in therapy, this is from a client that she had, I'm still going to feel guilty if I say no to my father. But if I keep saying yes, I'm going to feel angry. So if I'm going to change, I guess I will just have to learn to live with some guilt for a while. So if this place that we get stuck in, this, this room that we get stuck in, there's really two doors out of it, as I like to say. One is a doorway where we're going to feel angry, and one is a doorway where we're going to feel guilty. And what Dr. Lerner suggests or invites us to understand is that we can walk through the, the doorway of guilt, and, and we can learn to deal with that, learn to cope with it. Because guilt, and I'm going to say this more than once tonight, is not about conscience. It's not a, a measure of our morality or our goodness or our ethos. It's none of those things. It is an internalized sense that when we don't take care of somebody else, we don't perform our duties, our obligations, that we are bad, that, that we've done something bad, and that in essence we are bad. I don't separate out, of course, guilt and shame very much at all like many people do. Boundaries are hard principles to understand like I started off with tonight because they are subtle. That's why I like to tell stories about boundaries. I, I shared this with you, I, I think, on Monday. that I had several questions over my last two presentations to parents where they would ask me questions about what do you say to a child in this situation? How do you respond to it? And, and, and it's, it's difficult to, to answer that question because, number one, the discussion is a dialogue. And, and each answer to each question then invites it a different kind of response. And so I can tell stories. I can give you examples about what it looks like. But I can't tell you the right thing to do because it's about you. It's about yourself. And your bound I'll use the simplest of examples. Let's use the, the example of swearing. Your boundary around swearing might be different than mine. That doesn't mean that mine is right and yours is wrong. I've just learned what I'm comfortable with. And that's how I set up my life. But you might be comfortable with something else. You're not wrong. I'm not right. We're different. Your, yours is valid and mine is valid. And, and this, this lends itself to that webinar in that chapter in my book where I talk about the myth of being right. We don't even know how to live in a world where we're talking about being valid for who we are, for what we feel, for what we want. That is because we were told, often by our parents or others in our culture, or later on by spouses sometimes and sometimes by our children, brothers and sisters, we were called names like selfish, self-centered, irresponsible, narcissistic, cold-hearted, uncaring. We were called those things by other people to try to get us to change our boundaries. We were told that we were bad when we set up a boundary, when we didn't do something that somebody wanted us to do. And we lost in that exchange, we lost a moral centeredness, a moral clarity, an ability to figure out who we are. Instead, if the others in our lives said, well, I'm hurt by that, but that's mine to own, so I'm going to have to deal with that. If, if people had communicated that way to us when we were young and throughout our lives, then we would know. We, we would also be able to have empathy and understanding, and we could respond to that if we wanted to, if it didn't compromise who we were but we would know we're not responsible for other people's feelings. We would know that other people being upset with us is not a measure of whether or not we are good or lovable. So, again, we, we talk about this change in sensibility. The change in sensibility is that boundaries are about the self. And, and like the webinar I did last week, the more developed and clear the self is, the clearer our boundaries become. And then the amazing thing that happens in our lives with, with all of our loved ones is people begin to reorient themselves to this new version of things. They don't celebrate 
the setting of boundaries. People don't cheer them on typically. Some people do. More evolved people do. Healthier people do. More clear and enlightened people do. But often, people don't. They react as if we're something's wrong with us in the process. And we have to be able to tolerate that. And that's why going to therapy where somebody can find you, can help you find yourself, you can have the confidence to weather that storm, weather that, that emo emotional tension that comes after you set a boundary. Boundaries are invisible and conceptual. They are not defined by behavior. Right? If I don't want drugs and alcohol in my house, that's not a, a technique. That's not a behavior. That's a boundary. And so there might be different ways of executing that boundary. I might have limits with my children. I might leave my wife if she's drinking and using drugs. I might ask her to go to therapy first, of course, and treatment, but eventually I might, I might leave if, if people aren't able to, if, if, if my partner isn't able to respond to that, or if my children don't respond to that, they can go to treatment or there can be consequences associated with it. So th there's a lot of ways to, to execute the boundary of I'm not comfortable with alcohol and drugs in my house. And you get to decide what's non-negotiable. You get to decide the difference between a preference and a, a clear boundary in your life. And I don't get to tell you what that is, what the right level is, what the right thing is. They're measured by the intention, right? What, what it comes from. Again, as clearly as I can say this, boundaries are not to change other people. I don't set a boundary with my client, for example, to teach them a lesson. I don't set a boundary with my children to teach them a lesson. I, I, I identify a boundary and I set a limit in, in my house or in a relationship. If my boundary is I don't want to be touched in anger, in other words, physically abused, that's my boundary. I'm not comfortable with that. Then with my partner, I say, if this happens, I'll call the police. If this happens, if this becomes any kind of a pattern, it happens more than, than, than just once, then I'm, I, I can't be in the relationship anymore. So that's my limit. I'm not willing to be in a physically abusive relationship. And again, that comes at, at an emotional cost. It comes at a, a, a cost practically in our lives when we set boundary. Those are the dragons that we have to face. Those are the dragons we have to come up against. Those are the demons that we fight. Those old echoes, those old messages that get recirculated, that get reincarnated in our current context. Right? They come through the voice of our children. That's the amazing thing about parenting is we train unintentionally our children about all of our dragons and demons because we respond so instinctually to a certain phrase, to a certain tone, to a certain behavior. We respond and, and, and we reveal the, the, the nature of our dragons, of our demons to our children. And then they adopt those. Like I say, we load the gun with bullets that have the specific names of our dragons, our demons on them. That's how it works. We find people in our lives. We, we, we match up with people who end up echoing, reincarnating those demons and, until we learn what we need to learn from them. And I want to be as clear as I can about this. Setting a boundary with somebody, with, with a spouse, with a child, in the short run, there's often going to be a backlash. In family systems theory, they call it a homeostatic response, right? Harriet Lerner calls it a change back response. So, so those responses that are to discourage us from setting the boundary, that's the short game. And you're going to lose a lot in the short game. My experience with boundaries is the more I've set them in my life, the more I'm surrounded by people who respect them. And I've lost some friends. I've lost some people. And I've gained some people. And I've seen some people who have evolved as a result of me setting boundaries. My mother, for example, being one. Setting a very clear boundary with her. And, and, and that's beautiful. That's amazing. Because she was able to do what she needed to do to come and support me in a way that, that I needed. And it didn't take away from who she was. 
and she had to figure that out. And I was willing in all of those examples to lose people, right? It, it, it is the biggest risk that we take in life is to assert a boundary, to, to assert or set a limit in a relationship. And with, with the, the recognition, the possibility that we might lose that person. But there's no other way to do it. Not with our children, partners, friends, or anybody, business associates or, or whomever. Our, in, in, uh, our insight about boundaries disappears in the face of stress or resistance to our boundaries, right? That's why, that's why we do the work over and over again. Because when pushed, when stressed, when those echoes from our history come out in other people, we lose our grounding. We lose ourselves in that process. And so we practice. We practice going to a place, physically going to a place where there are people. We can talk to therapists, uh, AA meetings, Al-Anon meetings, whatever it is. We go to a place where somebody can hold us, who we are. Somebody is okay with who we are. And then we settle into that. And, and we get better over time at that. But we can get knocked off of that when, when, when struck in, in, in just the right way from people. They're related to so much of what we do and, and, and what we are treating. It has to do with communicating clearly, stating our intention, making requests of people, learning to listen and respond to people. It has to do with the enabling that we do. Right? We, we actually, when somebody says to me, he can't treat me that way, my response is, yeah, he can. He can until he's not allowed to. She can until she's not allowed to. She can do whatever she wants. You like her not to, but she might not stop until you close the door. And that's so, we, we really hope that others, that our children will change so that we don't have to set a boundary. If I can get you to change, if I can use any other method possible, begging, pleading, threatening, debating, arguing, you know, whining, nagging. If I can use one of those techniques to get you to change, then I don't have to do the scariest work at all of all, which is to set a boundary and to take the risk of losing love. Right? That, that's the essence of the challenge there. In control versus influence, it, it, it speaks to this idea about setting clear boundaries but letting go of the outcome. Right? If I set a clear boundary, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to show up authentically. And the minute I get honest with you and show up authentically, I lose the capacity to control your reaction to me. If I lie to you, if I try to manipulate you, if I soften it, if I give it to you in, in, a, in a tricky kind of way, then, then I'm holding on to controlling the outcome, the reaction that you have. And I have mentioned earlier, but the Dance of Anger by Harriet Lerner, in my experience, I think it's to, to, to the heart of the matter of boundaries as well as any book I've ever read. Enmeshment in parenting. I want to talk about the fusion that happens in parenting, the over-identification, right? It, it, we have to learn that we're not responsible. Um, excuse me, that, that, we, that we are responsible for our own feelings but we're not responsible for other people's feelings or reactions to us, right? It's interesting because there's a subtlety to that, right? Like, I can see my part. If I'm cruel to you and you have a angry or, or very, you know, a, a horrible reaction to it, I can own up to that. That's, that's okay. That's empathy, that's sensitivity, that's accountability, that's awareness, that's courage, that's ego strength. But ultimately, if I show up with kindness, with love, with authenticity, with effort, I, I, I then can't control your reactions. And there's a kind of self-forgiveness in that principle. People that, that struggle with enmeshment, they, they, they don't own their own feelings. They put it on other people. They blame other people. You know... The thing I see with parenting a lot of the times with my cases that I work with is that parents model this. They, they, they feel responsible for children's mistakes. They have guilt and shame about it. And then they, in the next breath, they ask the question, why does she blame me? Why does he blame me? And my thought is because you, you teach it. When you defend yourself, when you try to be right, 
when you argue with them about blaming you, you're, you're doing it. You don't, you don't argue with an unreasonable premise, an unreasonable idea. It doesn't affect you because it's nonsense. You wouldn't argue with a child who was trying to argue that the moon was made out of cheese. And, I, and again, that's a, that's a yeah, ridiculous example, but, but it's that idea. Like, if I know I'm okay, I think this is so powerful. If I know I'm okay in a given situation, meaning I know that my intentions are, are good, are from love, are from kindness, are from effort, are from healthy self-care. If I know all of that, I don't really need to be responsible for your reaction. An, an enmeshed person blames other people. There's a lack of discipline and practice in that person. They're reactive. right? They, they make quick decisions and reactive decisions. They lose response flexibility. An enmeshed person measures closeness as sameness or ability to manipulate. That's important. You know, intimacy, ironically, is, is the really the presence of two others, right? Two different people that have compassion and, and patience and can support each other, but that are very different. I've told the story of the, the older gentleman who gave advice at a, at a wedding toast. He said to the couple, if you're not fighting, then one of you is an idiot. Because this is a, this is a tough thing to be in an intimate relationship. And he didn't mean fighting like out of control. Fighting, he meant doing the work, standing up for yourself, struggling with it a bit. So closeness and sameness is not, a, or an ability to control somebody else, for somebody to do what you want them to do, is not a measure of closeness. Mesh people feel a sense of control through meeting others' needs and then being validated. Right? I'm going to get my needs met through you loving and appreciating me. That's how I'm going to feel good. Versus the courageous and heroic act of, of discovering the self. Figuring out who I am. Learning to be okay with that. And you do need other people to do that. In my experience, you need a therapist or somebody who can hold you, who can contain you. But that's a very different relationship than me being good to you and you loving me and that being that feeding me. There's a power struggle, a quid pro quo, another way of saying strings attached. When you're finding yourself resentful, oftentimes you will notice that there was a string attached where you didn't know there was or where you weren't paying attention, where it wasn't overt or it wasn't agreed upon by the other person. So they get their needs met through other people. They set boundaries to change other people. Right? They're always trying to teach a lesson. It's the wife who threatens her husband that she's going to leave him if he doesn't stop drinking. And I'm not saying set a healthy boundary. I'm saying, I'm going to leave you so you'll stop drinking versus I'm going to leave you because I can't be in this anymore. They give with strings attached. They, they expect mind reading. He should, she should know. They should know how to treat me or how I want to be treated. They should notice it. Versus, again, that, that would be convenient, but then we would never grow into a self. So we have to learn how to say, this is what I, I need, this is kind of a non-negotiable for me, and this is what, what it is. They confuse love with need. It's a, it's a lovely quote from the letters of Juliet to the Nine Rusty Armor, where she discovered, upon her own reflection, she said, it was so hard for me, dear Knight, to admit I had brought others what I wanted, not what they wanted. I call this caring or nurturing before. Boundaries are where you stop and I, where I start. And what that means is I'm clear about what my needs are. I'm clear about what I want. I'm clear about what I think and what I believe. And I don't impose that on you. I don't need you to feel and think the same way. I respect your otherness, your difference. I don't try to get you to think, feel what I want. When I'm parenting you, when I'm treating you, I'm treating you from the place of authenticity, not trying to heal some wound from my childhood, not trying to give you what I didn't get. Right? I heal that wound where it needs to be healed so that I can be present with you in an authentic way. You own your own feelings. You own your own feelings. I'm responsible for this. I'm responsible for how I feel, and I'm responsible for what I do with that, for how I heal that and how I respond to that. And that's really important because if we teach our children that, that they are to blame for our upsetness, then they're justified in blaming us for their upsetness. 
right? I mean, it, it follows. Unless, of course, we have this fantasy that we're just right. Then, of course, that's our way out. You don't make me responsible for what you feel. Uh, your serenity, your peace, your anxiety, your anger, your upsetness is your responsibility, not mine. You don't try to put it on me. And I, I'm talking about ideals. We all make mistakes in these areas, but this is what this is the aspiration. What you think about me is not my problem. It's not my business. At the same time, th th there's a th there's a dialectical here because these kinds of people are also very empathic and are willing to admit fault, are willing to be accountable when they mess up, right? That's that's different. I'm accountable for me and my actions and understanding how that impacts you. That's what that means. I'm not responsible for your actions. I communicate assertively rather than passively, and that takes courage. That's a risk. I stop stop trying to get me to do something so you feel okay. Right? That's a boundary. Even for our children, that would be appropriate if they could have that language to say that. I'm responsible to take care of myself. I'm responsible for my happiness. Right? That's the, the, the kind of end of it. I'm responsible for being happy. You're not as my spouse, as my parent, as my friend, or as my child. So I have to do something to increase my serenity, my happiness, my joy. And, and there's a way to have a relationship, even with your pain and your sadness and, and your sorrow where it's not useless suffering, right? We can start to understand and stay connected and have a, a degree of serenity throughout all the range of emotions. Boundaries are the emotional and psychological perimeter of the self. They can change and they don't have to be right. This is what I believe. This is what I can tolerate. This is for me. This is what I'll allow in my heart. This is what I can accept in my home. Limits relate to our boundaries and are in reference to our boundaries. They are the behavioral constraints we set they evolve and adapt over time and throughout development. These are the grades, these are the curfews, these are the rules, this is the language you can use in the South. Those are the relationships. So they, they, they lead to or inform the other. The boundaries inform the limits. But the boundaries are foundational. They are the, the outline of the self. Whereas limits are the things we set up. What are signs of poor boundaries? Like I said, it's the, all of those efforts to do something else so you don't have to set one. Yelling, nagging, arguments, fights that are repeating, comments, even repeating I feel statements can be an example. It's trying to influence the other, emotionally coerce the other person, wear the other person down. Trying to guilt or shame others, blaming them. My, my nine-year-old did that to me the last couple of nights. Last night she tried to get me to do something for her and I said, I, I can't right now, I'm exhausted. And she said, but don't you love your daughter? <laughs> and we all laughed about it. I said, that's very wise of you, but I'm not going to be shamed. And then tonight she tried a similar type of thing. And, and, my, and her older sister said, you're doing that guilting thing again. All right? So we, we, we learn how to do that. When we learn, our children learn because we teach them what our vulnerabilities are. Um, guilt or shame or making excuses. Right? Guilt and shame. Are, are, are signs of us having poor boundaries. They are associated with poorer mental health, less evolved, developed selves, more dependent. They're, they're not, it's one of my life's missions to, to remind, to teach people that guilt, I know people are pretty clear about shame, but the guilt also is a sign of less evolution, less development. Owning or, or someone else's successes or failures, our children, we do that. We all struggle with that. We measure ourselves by their successes and failures. Uh, resentments that linger or repeat, right? That we just get stuck in them. I, I, I use the word obsess when I find myself obsessing over a resentment. Hoping somebody will take care of us, not recognizing that this is our job. Expecting or resenting others to act like we would do or, or we do do. Right? I would never treat somebody that way. That's an okay place to inform yourself. Like, I'm not okay with this. This is not the way that I want to be in a relationship. But, but that's why so much of the stuff that I talk to you guys about is not for you to repeat to your child. It's for you to know so that when you can talk to your child, you have a healthy boundary. 
almost nothing on this webinar tonight ideally would ever be repeated to your child from you but this would be stuff that would give you the strength the foundation the sense of okayness with yourself so that you could be in a relationship with your child where you could execute strong boundaries triangling talking about somebody to somebody else right it's, it's easy even in therapy some of the hardest work I've ever done and the hardest work that I think my clients have ever done is talk about our relationship right I think it's still okay of course we're gonna talk about other people but but talking to someone about them is the most difficult thing that we can do a lot of the times not seeing our part in things or thinking this has come with guilt and blame thinking this has to come with guilt and blame so in other words it's okay to say you dented your kids you left your stink on them you did some more than others some worse than others and that doesn't have to be associated with a tremendous amount of guilt or, or, or blame or shame you just did because you're human and you were dented by your context and the more we can just look at this and see it for what it is what it's just just human beings doing human things the more we're going to be able to heal it and to grow but if everything is cloaked in guilt and blame and shame it's going to be so difficult to do what I just said not knowing that we have control over others or excuse me not knowing what we have control over you know the serenity prayer idea that we have control only over ourselves and not over other people the concept of ownership the essence of ownership owning and or stating our feelings for the sake of being heard while letting go of the reaction ownership is being responsible for your feelings and truth and avoiding the idea that others need to be shaped up or fixed by them and remembering that a boundary is a boundary is a boundary talking about a boundary thinking about a boundary you know hoping for a boundary wishing pleading none of those are boundaries a boundary is an awareness perhaps a stated sense of this is what I can and can't tolerate and then setting up a, a, a limit an expectation in a relationship and then following through on that going to meetings watching webinars attending therapy telling your friends or spouse how you want to be treated telling others you can't treat me that way is not a boundary talking about like I said talking about reading about learning about whining threatening warning and lecturing about boundaries are not boundaries they are an attempt to avoid facing the reactions of others when we have set boundaries in our lives so moving on to self-care because this is really what boundaries are about it's about caring for one's self it's an assertive and honest acknowledgement of your needs that's what self-care is it's a request and attempt to meet your own needs it's the awareness that you are in charge of taking care of yourself it is a model for others that you matter that people matter and encourages empathic resonance in others and that's why I, I say in the book one of the most difficult things for children is the unlived life of a parent if a parent has no boundaries if a parent has no needs that, that get expressed then a child never has to learn to respond to the other and then parents wonder why children are so self-centered so stuck in kind of this narcissistic pattern it's because they were never required to have to deal with an other and that other person's needs so it's okay for you to have needs and to take care of them maybe even worse than not having any needs or any expressed needs and taking care of them is thinking that you do everything for your child because you don't do everything for your child it's impossible number one and it's not ideal it would never teach them frustration tolerance or delay of gratification or, or learning how to adjust to other people but it's, it's different to say this is for your good versus, versus this is what I need to feel okay that's why I've been coaching for the last year and a half using the phrase with parents when you talk to your children saying this is what I need this is the way I'm gonna set it up this is what I need to feel comfortable this is my boundary this is my limit it's not guilting or blaming others for not meeting your needs and it's not getting your needs met indirectly through other people from James Hollis's book the, the Eden Project the search for the magical other he says it takes great courage to ask this fundamental question what am I asking of this other that I ought to be doing for myself if for example <clears throat> I'm asking the other to be mindful 
of my self-esteem. I have a project waiting unaddressed. If I'm expecting the other to be a good parent or to take care of me, then I have not grown up. If I am expecting the other to spare me the rigor and terror of living my own journey, then I've abdicated from the chief task and most worthy reason for, reason for my incarnation on this earth. We, we've mixed up what love is. We weren't taught it and, and modeled it in a lot of cases. And this is what Hollis is teaching us, what it means to be a self and what it means to be in relationship. And we have some mixed up ideas about it. Right? We have some mixed ideas that it's about needing somebody. It's about somebody meeting all of your needs. Obviously, there's compromise and there are contracts and relationships. But compromise and contracts are, are part of two assertive others working out what they can do for each other, what they're willing to do, but not at the cost of oneself. Right? And the more self-care we, we exercise... The more self-care we practice, the more capable we are of loving and generosity to other people. The less self-care we practice, that, that, that we even know about, the more it's going to be all these strings attached and games and hidden contracts and covert alliances and so forth. What are examples of self-care? can be rest and relaxation, vacations, staring at the wall. You get to decide. Exercise, indulgences such as massage, therapy, hobbies, reading, TV, time without judgment. Dr. Dennis, cleaning, advice that you would give somebody. Things that you would encourage somebody else to do for themselves. Self-advocacy and, and assertion and work. Work is a wonderful piece of self-care. The question becomes, does this get out of balance, right? If all we're doing is vacationing, that's going to be a problem. If all we're doing is working, if all we're doing is watching... Read, all we're doing is watching TV, that's a problem. But you get to do what you get to do, what you want to do, what you like to do. You get to do it. And it's important that you fight through the guilt and practice this balance of taking care of yourself. Why self-care is important? Because it fills you up in order that you might give it to others. It prevents stealing from others, right? People that, that I work with who, who struggle with self-care often end up being a greater burden on other people. Self-care presents martyrdom, resentment, and being a victim and blaming other people. But again, you have to fly right into the face of guilt to do that. It models a healthy balance for our children. It requires our children the, the, the need to develop empathy. Because you deserve it, self-care is valuable because you deserve it, because you're worth it. And you need it whether you admit it or not. You can't do it without it. Harry Lerner, Lerner talks about the nice guy syndrome. We keep it to ourselves and we avoid making clear statements about what we think and feel. We lose clarity of ourselves, and there are three risks involved in this good guy syndrome. We assume responsibility for other people's feelings and reactions. We relinquish, number two, we relinquish our primary responsibility to proceed with our own growth and ensure the quality of our own lives. And lastly, we behave as if having a relationship is more important than having a self. I think those are three great red flags, things for us to be aware of, and how many of us can identify those in our parenting. So what gets in the way of our self-care? It's work. It takes work. There's a fight. It's not natural. You're, it's going to be, for a lot of us, it's going to be counterintuitive. There are going to be emotional barriers to self-care particularly guilt, shame, and anxiety. Fear, fear of rejection, fear of being bad, fear of being selfish, fear of what others, what others think. We're often taught, like I said at a young age, um, that to need is to be undesirable. Right? The needy baby, the crying baby, is not a good baby. The baby that has no needs is the good baby. So from birth, we're defined that the less we need, the more good we are. <clears throat> we are taught that selfishness is wrong, bad, and ugly. There, there's ignorant selfishness, but then there's wise selfishness. When a client says to me, what's in this for me? I'm thinking, good question. Why would I ever want you to do anything that wasn't going to make you have a more joyful, fulfilled life? That wasn't going to make you richer spiritually and emotionally? There would be, that would be insane. 
That's the goal. Those are the goals. So to, to want, it's just that people that gobble up everything, who don't share, who aren't compassionate, they're, they're, they're poorer of spirit, right? They're closed off. They're led by fear. So it's okay to want to be happy, to want to feel okay, to want to be fulfilled. Our parents and others pass on this sense, their sense of inadequacy to meet our needs as pathology in us. So when I can't take care of my child, then I make them wrong. When I can't be there for them in the way that they require, then something is wrong with them and I tell them that. You're being selfish, you're being a jerk, you're being this. Because again, if I can shame you into being different, then I don't have to take care of myself. We don't know how. We just haven't had a model. Some of it is ignorance. We meet our needs through others. This is the core of codependency by seeing our value, our worth, our meaning in relationship to the other. So essentially, that's how we end up in that place. So what are the take-homes? First and foremost, progress, not perfection. Have compassion for yourself and for others in this process. Forgive yourself for being imperfect. Even forgive yourself for being a perfectionist. None of us are going to get this right. And all of us are going to struggle with this. I've never met a person, and I have some people in my life that I admire fantastically in this area, but I've never met a person who doesn't still struggle with this in their life. Understanding our own programming from our family of origin how we were taught to feel responsible for others. That's really what the workshops I, I do are about. It's about figuring out the lessons, figuring out where those echoes, feeling, figuring out why you are so vulnerable and hamstrung to certain things that are said and done by your children and by others. We teach others how to treat us, not by complaining or teaching or expressing anger, but by our actions. Right? We, we, have to, we have to require others to treat us a certain way for them to have the pleasure of our company. And again, I'm not talking about a rigidness where every little thing is a requirement, but I'm talking about some fundamental core things. We're gonna to have to negotiate differences for sure, but being violent with me, bringing drugs into my home, being unkind to me, right? There are some things that I can say, I require this of you. We treat others how to treat us, not by complaining or teaching, but by our actions. I already said that. There is some loneliness in our journey. I've talked about our dragons. There will be dark times during this work. And it's worth it. And it's freedom and it's light on the other side. Working on our boundaries will lead us to a sense of empowerment, hope, and liberation. The individual who works on his or her boundaries will feel less depression, less resentment, and less anxiety. How many of us struggle with one of those three categories? You'll have to resist the urge to measure yourself by others' responses. Don't measure the, the rightness or wrongness of your action by whether or not people are upset with you or pleased with you. You'll never get free. Do it for you, but if you won't do it for you, do it for your child. If you want to start there, start there. Because both of you benefit from this work. Try new things and tolerate the anxiety of getting it wrong or being awkward. I was talking to the parents on Sunday night when I was speaking in Brooklyn and I was saying, don't wait for the perfect language. Don't wait for you to get it perfect. It's going to be sloppy. Dr. Lerner calls it the, the, she calls it the obnoxious phase in therapy when people do it in a clumsy way. Tolerate guilt. Remember that guilt is not your conscience speaking. It is your parents' voice or others that you hear in your head. It's what you were trained to think about yourself when you asserted yourself so that you could get back in line and make other people feel comfortable. Go to meetings. If not therapy, go to meetings. And ideally, go to a retreat. I do some deep work in this. It's been my, even though I've been going to therapy for 20 years, some of my deep, intensive stuff has been kind of the cornerstone of my therapy. I wrote a blog on drbradreedy.com called How, How Parents' Limitations Affect Children. So... I'll, I'll invite you to that because it talks about that when we we don't have unlimited capacity as parents. And so when that happens and we have to 
get self-care, get fed spiritually, emotionally, how does that impact our children? So that also could be helpful to you. What if the boundary might be a result of thinking error? Even if a boundary is something for me to feel, okay? Well, that's where, where I think working with a therapist can be a way to help you get clear. Part of my work is to kind of help you figure yourself out. So I'll ask questions of you in the process to help you figure out where you're coming from. So that's that's my way of you know keeping it honest, keeping it true in the process. But sometimes, you, you know, there's there's a danger in this too, because my boundaries have changed over time. Okay, I'll use swearing as an example. How I felt about children swearing 20 years ago is different than how I feel about it today. So. Was I wrong? Should somebody have pointed out my thinking error 20 years ago? Because I think now my boundary, I, I'm more clearly identified with that. And I realize that that old way came from some of my limitations and limiting beliefs and so forth. But I get to set that. And so I think it's okay to do that. So I, I think it's important to do the, this kind of self-assessment that you're talking about. I think the, the problem gets into is when we try to change somebody else's thinking error. When you come at me and saying, this is what I do or don't want in my life, and I try to teach you how that's wrong. But family therapy, couples therapy, parenting therapy, individual therapy can all help you on your journey to get clearer and clearer. I feel differently about certain boundaries than I did 20 years ago. I bet you all of you can identify that. And you might even be able to say about yourself to yourself, my position today I believe is more evolved than it was 20 years ago. But I still deserve respect back then. I still was entitled to set the boundary the way that I wanted to. But I think therapy is the, is, the, is the way to protect against that or the way to evolve through that. This is not my strength in parenting. In the past, my boundaries were permeable. Now my boundaries are impermeable, black and white at this time. Are boundaries supposed to be black and white because it seems easier for me to hold the line when they are? I think black and white in reaction to the permeal boundaries is kind of a normal pendulum swing. I, I wouldn't punish you for that. I think the fact that you can say that is wise. I think it's sometimes easier to have more black and white boundaries, for sure. But again, I, I can identify with this because I, I've, I've swung that pendulum also. And then, you know, then you can get to a place in, in, in a grayer area. The more elegant and skilled that you get at exercising your boundaries the more you can tolerate the gray but black and white can be a first step to, co to, to correct for that it might be an overcorrection but again you get to do that if you were my client I would I would hold you with respect in that area I would understand it it would make sense to me and when you were ready after some comfort after some a context where you felt safe to kind of experiment with a little bit more gray you would. And until then, this is okay too. Sometimes I doubt myself when I set a boundary. For example, I'm being too rigid. I'm not being tolerant or patient enough. How do you know if your boundary is fair or if you need to grow out of it? That, that's the question. That's the right question. And that, that self-doubt you have, that's what comes from knowing yourself, right? This is about self. This is about knowing who I am and knowing that it's okay who I am. I'll use a silly example, but I don't like squash. I've used this example before. I don't like squash. I've, in my adult life, have had over 50 people try to talk me out of that. Right? I, in my professional career, I am more comfortable at 50 years old, almost 50 years old, I'm more comfortable with what I'm bad at. And I'm more comfortable with what I'm good at. And I defer and ask other people to help me with the things that I'm bad at more and more often. I give them responsibilities. I delegate. I promote people. So um, that's because I'm, I'm more comfortable. I'm sure you are more comfortable with yourself at your age than you were 20 years ago. That, that's the wonderful part about growing up. So it's a work. It's, that's, what, that's what my therapy is about. I, I'm more okay with what I want, what I feel, what I think, what I believe today. I'm less doubtful of it than I was 20 years ago. I'm, not, I'm nowhere near perfect. 
But if, if, if this progress continues to happen, I'm really looking forward to my 50s and my 60s. Right? Those, those must be, if this trajectory continues as it has in the past 20 years, I'm very excited about what's ahead. And I'm going to keep working on it and keep going to therapy. And the, the last part of the question, which I didn't think I answered, how do you know if your boundary is fair if you need to grow out of it? I think you just, that's the practice, right? You get to decide. You get to decide. Now, I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour. The more capacity that you have, which comes from healthy self-care, the more flexible you often are, the more you can hold, right? That's why so much of the parent support that we provide for you, the, these webinars that we offer for life, right? The reason we do this is because the more we can feed you, the more we can, you know, I went to therapy, I had my therapy session tonight, and I, I had a tough day. I thought it was ironic. I told her that I was doing a, a webinar on self-care tonight because I was struggling with this issue so much. And I vented. I vented about my frustration, about several areas of my life, and about how exhausted I was. And by the end of the session, I was relaxed on the couch. And she said, do you notice how relaxed you are? So, she says, as she always says, I'm so glad that you're talking about that. And I need that place. I need that place where I can go and take care of myself. And then I have more capacity for my family, for my children, for my clients, for my colleagues, my employees. Sometimes I doubt myself when I set a boundary. Okay, that's the one I just answered. You talked about setting a boundary about having alcohol in the house. I have no problem setting that boundary with my child, but I struggle to do it with my spouse. How can I tell another adult who shares my home with me that I don't want him to drink in his home? It's, it somehow doesn't seem fair to him, even though that's what I want, and even though I'm a recovering alcoholic myself. I mean, the answer is you get to decide. It's not just let's get rid of the word fair. You get to decide, and and. and for most people, I, I don't know where you stand on For most people, that's not a line that they have where you can't have any alcohol in this house or I'll, I'll leave you. But that could be your line. It's not for me to say one way or the other in that equation. And he could say, I'm not willing to do that or I am willing to do that. He gets to decide. There's a great line from the book, um, Illusions. It's a great book about accountability and, and personal choice. And... He basically says, you know, you get to decide, then they get to decide. Then you get to decide, then they get to decide. So you get to decide if this is non-negotiable. If having alcohol in your house is unsafe for you and intolerable for you, you get to decide that. If it's a preference that you wish, then you can state that. And if you're willing to negotiate, you get to decide that. And then he gets to decide if he wants it or not, or he'd rather stay in a relationship with you so it's not that big of a deal or it's, it's fundamentally violating to who he is, he gets to decide that too. So you get to decide preferences, negotiations, non-negotiables, hard lines in the sand. But there's no, it's not about fair or not fair. All right, Stephanie tells me that's all the questions for this evening. Upcoming announcements, the next workshop we want all parents to go to is on the 28th, 29th of January at Entrada. Contact Gail at EvokeTherapy.com for more information. The next Finding You after this weekend, that's full. The next one is on February 19th through 20th in Park City. Finding, fam fam finding Family in March. Uh, email attentives at EvokeTherapy.com for more information. These are wonderful places to do this work, to figure this stuff out. We want every family to go to 12, 6, to go to 6, 12-step support groups while their children are with us. If you haven't started, do it now. Um, you can go to Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, Naranon, or Al-Anon, Alateen. Um, also go to nami.org, N-A-M-I.org, for resources, free classes in your area. The next parent support groups, next one is in Los Angeles, January 29th. That's a Sunday. We'll do the 4 p.m. potluck, 5 to 7 parent meeting in Studio City. In the Bay Area on the 31st, we're going to go across the across the bay now to San Mateo the San Francisco Airport Marriott 
January 31st. Contact Stephanie at evoketherapy.com to RSVP or for more information. Remember, you can follow our podcast. You can download them so you can listen to them on the go, or you can use the Android app for uh, for the Android phones or devices. You can use the SoundCloud app. Search Evoke Therapy Programs. Twitter and Instagram at Evoke Therapy. Facebook, Evoke Therapy Programs. The Second Nature Alumni Foundation page on Facebook. Our blog, Pursuits Trips for Families or Young Adults for Sober Therapy Light Fun Adventure International Trips. My book is available on paperback or on audio version, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. Or go to the Parent Alumni Foundation book page on Amazon. Buy books there that are recommended by our therapists and a percentage of the proceeds goes to charities for people who can't afford therapy. All right, folks. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your contribution, your questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> we'll let you know the next topic. If you have any topic suggestions for me, I'm happy to take them. But the next webinar will be Thursday, January 19th. <coughs> Excuse me. Thursday, January 19th, 2017 at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. Have a great evening. I hope these points of contact are helpful. See you and bye-bye.